All right. Um, we'd like to welcome you to um, this not live session, but pre-recorded session for Dev Summit 2020 on uh, ArcGIS API for JavaScript, um, focusing specifically on 2D visualization. Um, my name's Christian Eginis. I'm a product engineer on the JavaScript API, focusing um, pretty much exclusively on these topics that we'll be talking about today. And I'm joined by Jeremy. Barley. Hi. Sorry we couldn't be there in person next year. Yeah, cool. Next year, yeah. Well, we have a lot to cover in this session. Um, it's an exciting one. I think that we, the JavaScript API is um, one of the most, if not the most powerful mapping library out there for visualization. And i um, excited to show you some of the stuff that we um, support and have to offer. So um, before I dive in to the session, I just uh, want to give you a quick uh, couple of points that, to remember um, that we're going to learn how to discover not only how to visualize the data, um, or geodata, I guess you could say, in the JavaScript API, but it's also how to do it meaningfully. That's the important bit there. We don't want to, I mean, you could create a pretty useless visualization in any library, including this one. Um, but we are going to show you some concepts and some tools that will allow you to help uh, visualize your data in a meaningful way. It's like, as Jim Harry says, you always have to have some story. What is the story that your app is trying to tell? And then you build the visualization to support the story, not the other way around. Exactly. Know your audience. Know, know the story. And alongside that, um, this is one thing to take away from this session is we really want you to get out and explore your data and figure out different ways to visualize it, because there's not one um, only one good way to visualize your data. It doesn't tell the whole story. So um, we'll show a number of examples throughout this um, session um, using the same data set, essentially, that can illustrate this concept of, you know, you may have one good visualization, but it, it, it may not tell the whole story. Um, so go crazy. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Christian's got some really good examples of this. But before we dive in, um, I just want to take a few minutes to give a quick overview of our API. Um, this is uh, typically comprised of our renders and symbols uh, APIs. And so before we dive into that, it's what can you visualize with the API? Um, pretty much anything. Uh, you can visualize where things are. Obviously, we're a, a mapping company, so you want to see the location. Um, you may not care about the data, just where something exists, such as these hurricane locations. Also, what? You can think of this as like your string data sources, like categories. In this case, it's points of interest. Where are the hospitals, the schools, places of worship, the parks? Um, the unique values, you can think of it that way. Also, uh, numeric data. How much of some attribute or variable exists in a particular location? In this case, it's the average household income in Los Angeles. Is it above or below the poverty level? And when stuff exists. Um, in this case, we're clustering 311 uh, calls in New York City to indicate um, which calls um, or where calls were uh, resolved uh, ahead of schedule versus behind schedule. Red meaning they were late in the resolution, and blue they were early. And then um, a combination of all or any of those uh, concepts can lead you to multivariate visualizations, such as this dot density one, um, where you can take not just one attribute, but multiple. So I'm going to actually show this app a little later. But it's not only dot density, but other there's many techniques that you can use to visualize more than one data. I think that where, what, how much, and when are really good things to think about when you're trying to come up with what are you trying to show? Uh, what question are you, are you trying to have people answer? Absolutely. So. On the most basic level, the symbols are what um, basically control your visualization. You want to think about your geometry type. When you already know that you're working with polygon data, point data, or line data, you have a certain set of symbols that you can work with. Poly polylongs are easy, and so are the points, because you um, basically have one type of symbol for polylines, the simple line symbol. And that basically allows you to control a style, color, and width of your line. Uh, point data, you have marker symbols, either simple ones or pictures. You also now have access to 
hundreds of out-of-the-box web style symbols that we'll talk about a little bit later, as well as sim symbols. That's your custom vector symbols where you can um, build your own symbol um, in Pro or even in code if you really wanted to and, um, and customize it there. It's scalable and, and, and works well. Paul. The one thing to add on the sim line symbol is that that's your vector marker symbol. That's where it allows you to do vectors uh, for your symbol, whereas the other custom vectors, not just our sort of out of the box simple shape vector shapes. Yes, yeah. If you want, if you want to go full custom, that's the one you you would probably want to look at. And then for polygons, you have a lot more at your disposal because it's not just about fills and picture fills, but you also can only visualize the centroid if you want to using any of the marker symbols that you can use for the point data. And so um, something that I think we do really well in our API is making it intuitive for defining these symbols in code. So if you want to create a, a simple icon, you just uh, construct the simple marker symbol. You can set it to any of our out-of-the-box primitive shapes. In this case, it's a diamond off to the right. And then you have an outline property. You can control the color, the width, and then, of course, the color of the fill of that symbol. As well as, you know, there's an example of the simple fill symbol. So you see these properties look very similar across all the symbols. That's by design. And you not only um, define colors by, um, you know, arrays of RGBAs, but you have all the CSS strings you can use, um, as well as, um, you know, our out-of-the-box color objects. And then web styles, this is relatively new on our 2D API, where you have um, hundreds of web styles um, at your disposal where you can uh, visualize them, as Jeremy said, on the sim side. These are actually built as sim symbols, but we package them with easy-to-read code snippets, as you see below this map here, where you know we have a number of styles and a number of names. In this case, it's the park style. They're vector, scalable, multi-layer, and you can override them to do some pretty cool, um, complicated um, uh, visualizations. What does it mean to be multi-layer? Multi-layer is, this is not referring to data layers. This is talking about symbol layers themselves. So if you look at the park symbol in this map, there's actually two symbol layers here. You have the background, which in some cases it's a pentagon shape with that white fill, or the circle with the white fill, and then you have um, the, the other symbol layer, which is the shape, in this case a tree. So you can add any number of symbol layers you want to. Obviously, you don't want to go too crazy, otherwise it won't make much sense, but you could, mm -hmm. in theory, yep. do that. Um, but what makes the visualization capabilities of the API particularly interesting is when you associate them with actual data values. Um, and the way that we design the API is by allowing you to render data by pointing to sources um, from any of these layer types. So we have primarily the feature layer, which hooks into a feature service or a client-side feature collection. Also, um, client-side data sources include the CSV layer, GeoJSON layer, um, as, and then you have um, map services that you connect to with the map image layer, and also stream services, which are your live data um, that streams into your browser. That's the stream layer. And the way you reference data is by either field values in your layer. So you could have a population field, and you reference it inside of a renderer, and then you can configure your visualization that way. Or if you don't have a particular field but you have that you want to visualize, say, for example, the percentage of the population that completed a bachelor's or a master's degree, you don't have that field, but you have those two fields together, you could create a, an arcade expression. And or, Jeremy, what's arcade? Just briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Arcade's a platform scripting language. Um, it's meant to be a simple language like Excel, but with geospatial features. Uh, what's important to note when we're talking about visualization, there's a certain profile of Arcade uh, that is supported. And so that profile is the visualization profile. So um, uh, really you can, when you're doing an Arcade expression that's going to power a visualization, you can only uh, operate on the feature and its attributes. So it doesn't allow you to do feature set type Arcade expressions which allow you to work with layers and 
uh, with other layers within uh, your uh, feature, and that's because of performance. It's got to be really fast, so it can really only act on that uh, feature. Yeah, and one way, like just looking at this example here, I like to think of it is, it's like a calculator or an Excel spreadsheet calculation. It's a way to client side calculate um, a new attribute, um, essentially. Yeah, it, gets, it makes it really easy to, you know, try things out, um, clean up data. I've used it a lot for that, um, and. Uh, Maybe it's more of an exploratory and, until I get to the point where, okay, now I know how to really clean this data up and then I'm going to calculate it. So. Yep. And we'll show you some examples of that as we move on through the session. And then um, before we get into some examples, uh, the renderer classes are essentially what controls how the data and the symbols work together. So we have the simple renderer. This is the case where we don't necessarily have a data value. We just want to render everything the same. So in that map there, you see uh, cities uh, rendered with the same symbol and highways also at the with the same color. So we don't necessarily want to call out an attribute value there. It's just where do those things exist? Heat map, sort of similar, except it's visualizing point data as a density on a surface. And then um, class breaks render, that's kind of the classic way of uh, visualizing numeric data by breaking it up into various classes. And then you have your unique value render, which that's your type um, data, or your, if you have unique values such as, you know, who won an election, and so you want to shade the polygons with the same fill for each candidate that, that won that particular area. And then you also have um, new, um, early last year, the dot density render, which is just another way of rendering numeric data as a density. Um, in this case, you just have basically dots that represent a, a single value. And then you render those dots randomly within a polygon, and it will indicate the density of that particular attribute. In this case, it's population. It's a very common um, way of looking at population density. And then we further break it up by uh, race and where they live. And then um, in code, this is what it would look like. You just, for simple render, you provide a symbol. All the features in that layer are rendered the same. Class breaks, you have a field or a value expression that you can pass to it. And then you have to map the expected values to ranges of min and max breaks, or min and max data values within a certain range of breaks. And you assign a symbol where all the features that fall into that break will be rendered with that symbol. And then um, on the flip side, you have the unique value renderer. Um, this is a case where we're showing a value expression or an arcade expression that will resolve to a string value. And then you take those expected returned values. In this case, it's Democrat, Republican, Independent. We're going to look at this very this exact example in just a couple minutes. And then we give them their unique symbols. And the last bit before we move on uh, is to talk about visual variables. Um, this is a way, it's a property on the renderer, um, and it's only for numeric data-driven continuous visualizations. And so the way to think, uh, I think about this is it's an alternative to the class breaks renderer. You, rather than defining set breaks, you can choose um, a color visual variable, a size, opacity, or rotation, or even a combination of those, as you see with that weather map kind of down on the bottom right hand part of the screen or the map above that one with the orange and the purple circles there's different combinations you can do of them that allow you to create some pretty interesting multivariate visualizations um but i think it makes one uh, before you go on yeah um one thing that uh, to call out is that uh, visual variables yeah like like christian said they work with your renderer so you can almost mix and match I guess before talking about that, the visual renders um, really call out like just like you said, color, size, opacity, rotation. You know that's what they would teach you in like um, cartography school. These are your these are your visual variables that you can apply to the map, and uh, um, it's really applying uh, uh, letting data drive how color, size, opacity, and rotation is is done. But you'll basically always start with the renderer. You have like a simple renderer, and then you might add a color visual variable or a color and size visual variable. Or you could start with a unique value renderer and then add a size visual variable. So color would show you what it is, and the size would show you how much is there. Yep. So you need some pretty cool 
visuals. And here's some examples in code of what that would look like. So as Jeremy said, you start with a simple renderer and you define a, a simple fill. If you're going to set a color variable, then you don't need to set a fill color. That will be overridden by your color variable. So I'm just going to control the outline um, in that symbol. And then I'm setting a, a color visual variable to the population that is in poverty, and I'm normalizing that by the total population. And then I'm mapping those values to, um, or I'm creating a set of stops. So if you look at that snippet, the values that have a value of 0.1 or 10% is another way to think of it, or less, they'll be given a pale yellow color. And then values that are 30% or higher, they're given, a, they're assigned a purple color. And any value that's above that will still begin a purple color, but if you're a value that's in between 0.1 or 0.3, it'll be interpolated appropriately. So you can see a nice smooth pattern um, for that data. Um, Similarly, you can do it for you know, size or opacity, and it's the same API. You just got to set the type to opacity, but the stops will be slightly different. Instead of saying color, um, you'll say opacity here. If you're using a size, then you indicate the size property of the stop. All right, so I think um, these concepts will make um, a lot more sense as we walk through some examples. So 2020 is an election year, um, so I thought it was appropriate to look at um, political party affiliation data. Um, I'm not going to drop any um, you know, political opinions here, of course. It's just you know, exploring the data. Fun fact, uh, first JavaScript API public app was released right the Sunday before Super Tuesday in 2008. Wow, so we are 12 years old. 12 years old, yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it was on uh, uh, elections. <laughs> <laughs> I would think so, right? <laughs> OK, so in this case, in this particular app, I'm going to create a render, simple render, with a simple fill symbol. It, this, is gonna, this is a counties layer I'm working with. If I look oops, over at the service, over here, the, the service, uh, uh, the, like the, the details page, I can see that this is counties, and it has a number of fields I can work with. But just to see if it, um, how it renders on, on my map, I'm going to assign this renderer to my layer using the renderer property, and then add that layer to the map. So you should see um, these symbols that have a white outline, and the style none will indicate no fill. So even though I indicate a color of green, you will not see that in this app. And so this is what the uh, counties look like. Nothing super interesting, right? Because it's not tied to a data value. But I could, if I wanted to, um, you know, change that to a solid fill or maybe something like a forward diagonal hash with a green color and, um, and render the data that way if I, if I really wanted to. Could you do the, the, the forward or the hash? Yeah, let's do it. And you can color the, you can color the forward hash any color. Yep, so this will be colored with a green color here. Yeah, and if you, so if you change it to red, it'd be a red hash. Absolutely. And there you go. Cool. Or you go backwards diagonal. Um, those oops. are the, just curious, those are the same ones that we have in 3x, or do we add to that? These are the, the enumeration. These are the same ones we have in the but 3x. But the, the 3x ones, you couldn't change the color. You cannot change the color in 3x. Yeah. So that's that's new in 4x. Yeah. Yes. This, All right. This came up in a customer meeting just earlier. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the case. I just want to double check. All right. So let's let's make this data a little more interesting. I know that I have um, a my field for working with political parties. This field name obviously isn't intuitive, um, but this is the total number of people registered to the Republican Party. And I'm going to say, you know, if, they, if there's no Republicans, I'm going to give it a dark color. Or if there's a lot, let's say 60,000, then I'll give it a lighter color. So I'm just adding a color visual variable to fill it. And this is the visualization I get. Now, Jeremy, would you find this uh, map particularly interesting or we're looking at total number of Republicans mm. here. 
Not really, because it really just shows you where people live. It, right, yeah, exactly. This is um, something that should make every cartographer cringe. I think it's a cool color ramp. But it looks visually striking. <laughs> yes, but you do not want to uh, use the solid fills to um, on polygons when uh, mapping total counts. You'll get Twitter shamed if you do that. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> not by us, because we're nice, but... But I mean, th this indicates that they're, um, that Republicans have a stronghold on Southern California and San Bernardino Cal County, LA County, and in other areas such as New York and Chicago. So as every good cartographer will tell you, you should normalize your data. And thankfully, the visual variables allow you to do that. We have the same renderer here, but the difference now is I have that field, and now I'm normalizing it by the total population that is of voting age. And then um, you may notice that the stop values look different. No longer am I using these totals of 0 to 60,000. I'm now doing ratios because we're essentially dividing the field by the normalization field. And I'm using this color ramp here. So the same color ramp, but across five stops. And if we look at that map, it changes all of a sudden to this. Mm. So now we see something a little different, right? No longer is LA and San Bernardino um, County, nor New York or Chicago really jumping out, but these other rural counties t jump out a lot. Now, what's the problem with this map? What's the problem with this map? Okay. Well, um, Well, I think that, I mean, there's probably a number of, of problems, but the, uh, I'm not sure which one you're going for, but I'll tell you what I don't like about <laughs> okay, it. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't like uh, that I don't see necessarily the striking patterns that I would see in the other map, but the colors also um, don't, uh, they, they tend to remind me of the Democratic Party, not so much the mm. Republican Party. Well, yeah, yeah, there's that too, yeah. And then uh, the legend, I think, is hard to read. It, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's legible on this screen, but if we look at it, it, it will tell you by default that you're dividing that... Oh, that's a good point, yeah. That, <laughs> that top value by the bottom value. You can always replace that with your own. And we will yeah. in the next one, okay. yeah. I think that my main comment on, other than the, all the comments you made, which I, I agree with, is that uh, this is just telling you where it's a high percentage or a high ratio. It doesn't actually mean that there's actually a lot of people there. So you yes. lose some of the people. Yeah, Because you know, if you look at this map, the whole country's bright. Bright is a high percentage of Republicans. You might think, oh, the whole country is for the Republican Party. But um, watching the uh, Super Tuesday and the CNN guy was going around and he was going through the map on Texas, mm -hmm. and he would click on a click on a county and was like, oh my gosh, Biden has a 75% to 25% <laughs> lead over Bernie. But then it was like 22 votes for Biden, you know, <laughs> five <laughs> votes for Bernie. And I was like, okay, I don't think that really matters. So, yes, there is the magnitude of the percentage also. Absolutely. And, we'll, and we're going to touch on that in just a second um, as we kind of look at another other ways to look at this data set. Um, another thing um, we, uh, you know, can, or you can do is use alternate color ramps. So um, there's above and below ramps. Um, so I'm going to use like this, uh, this green to orange above and below ramp. And instead of using the raw per, um, ratio values, I'm going to use an arcade expression. So let's go back to this one here. You see I'm just specifying the field normalization field. This is an example. I'll take those same values, divide them myself, and multiply them by 100, and that'll give me a more mm -hmm. understandable uh, value. Mm -hmm. And then you see whole numbers here, percentages. And then I can even change the labels to say the percentage symbol. Mm -hmm. And in, instead of having that awkward title, I can say this is the percentage of voters that identify as That's members. a great example, because like, the other one was really just a ratio, uh, but you wanted to talk about it like it was a percentage. Um, and by just doing these little tweaks, which add, add nothing to your uh, development time, can really just improve overall the understandability of what you're trying to show. Absolutely. So that looks, that's what it looks like here. Now we're seeing um, something else that's interesting. Now that we have an above and below mark, um, that 
value in the middle might not make a whole lot of sense, 20%, but uh, we might be seeing this, these same patterns on the green side um, with other parties, like the mm -hmm. Democratic Party, right? Yeah. I do like the color ramp, though, on that back, dark background. That's good. Yeah. Fun. All right. So we know we have values for Republicans, number of Democrats, and then we have the total number of people who don't affiliate with anyone or independent. Um, so let's say we want to show the counties, or we want to display the color of the county based on which is the most common or which party wins in that area. This is probably more meaningful in an actual election, maybe not so much in this case, but um, we might want to see all those patterns kind of converge. And one way to do that is through a predominance map. And that's a smart mapping style that and we're going to talk smart mapping in a few minutes, but um, that comes out of the box with the API. But you can also write your own um, uh, arcade expression that allows you to get that value. So I have my Republican field, my field for the total number of Democrats and independents. And then I use this decode function. This is an arcade function that will match um, an expression with a particular value. So I'm taking the maximum number between those three fields. And then if the Republican field matches, I'll return the string Republican. If Democrat is retur uh, returned, then I'll give it the, the, that string and then independent and so on. So if we look at this in the renderer, note that I put this in a script tag um, up high. Just want to make sure that you set the type to something that's um, not uh, that tells the browser that we're not running JavaScript, because otherwise this won't work. You can say plain text, uh, or you can be uh, a hipster and say Esri Arcade. <laughs> um, and then you know, give an ID so you can <laughs> uh, return it um, or reference That's it. That's way better, because you don't have to uh, write this one long string or concatenate it. Or... Yeah, if you, you know, have to support IE 11 or something and can't use mm -hmm. your yeah. um, string literal templates, then, then yeah, that's very nice to have. So I'm referencing that expression here. And notice that I changed my type to unique value because I'm using a string value. So I want to match, I want to shade my democratic uh, polygons with the blue symbol, Republican with red, and independent with yellow. And let's go ahead and see what this map looks like. So now we see some interesting patterns emerge. Now, Jeremy, I'm going to ask you a question again. OK, all right. I hope I get it right. OK. And you kind of you already touched on this, basically. Okay. If you were to look at this map, who would you think, which party do you think would be the most common in the country, just by looking well, at this? It looks like the Republican. I see a lot of red, but there's a lot more uh, independent other than I expected, too. Yeah, interesting. So, um, okay. so I'll actually reveal okay. the real numbers. OK. But let's, so we, <laughs> so we know that, that because of what Jeremy said before with total accounts, that this can be a pretty misleading map. We don't really know um, that, you know, there's way more Republicans than, than Democrats. They, they tend to dominate in the larger counties with the exception of maybe San Bernardino County. Um, but um, there's certainly more we can do here. So yep. one way we can do this is by adding a new visual variable. Um, so I'm going to add an opacity variable and also referencing an arcade expression, which I define here. And all this is doing is, is it's going to take that winning value, so the maximum. So you'll notice that this first part of the expression is almost exactly the same as the previous one. It's this last line that's different. I just want to return the percentage of the population that identifies with that prop, that uh, party, and then I'll reference that in a visual, an opacity visual variable in my renderer, and notice that I'm setting my opacity to a certain value. So I'm going to say if there's 44% or more that belong to that group, we're going to give it full opacity. And if it's less than 33, 33 meaning that it's contested between the three, they're all close to each other, or less, then, then it definitely doesn't win, and so we want to give it a lot less opacity. Now, what made you choose those numbers? Well, I chose uh, the value. Well, the 33 was because that's what you would get in the case of a three-way tie. But the 44 is sort of arbitrary. Mm -hmm. I just kind of had to play around with it a little bit. 
Um, if you tried 50, it was not enough? If I tried 50, it would give me, yeah, it wouldn't give me enough opacity uh -huh. or opaqueness, I guess, yeah. in some of those top okay. features. Cool. Um, and so I give this, you know, a pretty useful uh, title. So it's the share of the registered voters comprising that party. And so let's take a look at what this looks like. Okay, so we see something, you know, a little, mm -hmm. little different here. So independence, not quite as strong in that Midwest as, you know, yeah. might yeah. otherwise indicate. But you do see a really strong one down here um, by San Antonio, oh, well, interestingly do you, enough. Do you know what that is? I don't know. I don't know either. It might be a very, one of these 22 mm. type <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> number of people in this county. Um, but interestingly enough, these Democratic... Oh, true, that's true, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these Democratic uh, counties are very strong in Appalachia and throughout that belt in the south and the Mississippi River here. Mm -hmm. um, you also see a huge stronghold in these in Los Angeles, Chicago, kind of harder to see in New York. But if you zoom in, you definitely see it, Washington as well. Mm -hmm. And also, the rural areas show a lot of uh, Republican and even very strongly Republican areas. What's funny is, like, look at uh, Washington. Like, the whole state is red or yellow except for two counties. Yeah, I grew up in, in Spokane County, which is, it definitely leans more Republican, mm -hmm. but it's got a purple side to it as well, mm -hmm. which you kind of see here. It's not as a yeah, bright that's true. red. Um, but yeah, definitely most of... When I think there. of Washington, I always think very liberal because of Seattle, but yeah, interesting. So um, Jeremy already pointed out the things that are wrong with this map, and that's we don't get total counts, right? right. We don't see where it actually matters. So um, let's see what that actually looks like. So we're going to create just one more version of this map. In this time, we'll use those same visual variables, but we're going to add another one. And it's going to be a size variable. Here I define it, saying type size, value expression, and I'm just going to sum all those fields together. And then say this is the total voters that are you know belong to a party. And something a little different about the size variable, um, mainly due to, to you know, spec things that we can discuss later with with scaling our symbols is you can actually do it just between two stops so like a min size to a max size min data value to max data value so i'm going to say two million people or more we'll give them the largest symbol if it's a hundred people or less then we'll give it a very small symbol and of course it'll interpolate in between um, something else i want to call out is that i now need to create a simple marker mm. when i create my unique value infos otherwise you can't size a fill symbol. It's got to be a centroid uh, that we work with um, and an icon. Yep. And what's the new view we get of this data? Whoa. So now, if you were to look at this, would you still have the same opinion that no. Republicans are more um, prevalent? Probably not, though. We still don't know because mm -hmm. there's still a lot of red dots. Yep. But we do see more size in the urban areas um, relating to Democrats. So going back to Washington, um, yeah. you associate it because Seattle's got Something, that sizable yeah. population. Yeah. And then that yellow um, a party strong dot is so small. Uh, maybe well, four thousand people. Yeah. So yeah, pretty small. Yeah. Um, but it does give you a good idea of like cities. Uh, that are usually more democratic, but even in like Dallas and Houston, while it is blue, it's a lighter shade of blue. Yep, and Phoenix is you know solidly red. Yeah, so that's a big city where it kind of has the opposite pattern. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look at this, how what percentage of people would you say belong to each of these groups? Just guessing. Oh, just guessing. Oh man. And I'll tell you okay. the results right okay. now. Okay, I think. Uh, what year is this data? This is uh, 2000 and I would say 17, 18, okay. maybe. Maybe I, I'm going to say 35% um, Democrats, 38% uh, Republicans, and then the rest uh, independent. 
that's pretty good. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> I was, I, so I wouldn't have guessed. Uh, so when you look at the yellow category, the independent, um, I'm just like, oh, you know, 15% or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But there's actually 30% that wow. fall in that category. And then you have 33% Republican and 35 Oh, okay, Democrat. I had it flipped. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, nice. Um, if you were to just only show that solid fill, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get that. that at all. Yeah, yeah. The other data that's uh, slightly interesting to look at from the same perspective is uh, <clears throat> in the Living Atlas, they have the, you're very liberal, you're somewhat liberal. Yes. You're somewhat conservative, you're very conservative. And definitely more people consider themselves conservative. In the yes, US. yeah. <laughs> that's why I went with this data, because yeah. it wasn't quite as interesting. I yeah. mean, it's more interesting than that, yeah. for sure. Cool. Um, so, and this was kind of an illustration of that. Um, you have your Republicans. So this is another way. It's like, hey, we want to explore the data. This is where Republicans dominate, but this is mm. where Ooh, a I lot like of that them effect. happen, nice. right? Um, so, you, so yeah, the pattern you know tends to be rural, but you see that there's actually a lot more Republicans in LA than in a lot of these right. areas, mm. right? Um, so similarly with Democrats, you see those same patterns emerge, um, but then you have like mm. Chicago jump out, yeah. New York. Miami, interesting, and then independent or no affiliation. This darker one is kind of where they they tend to dominate, whereas the light yellow is is where there's fewer of them. And then we look at totals; it's the same areas, the same high population uh -huh. areas. You you see jump out. So while you see different striking visual patterns, mm -hmm. um, may not matter a whole lot, you know, mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things. It just makes a cool looking map. Yeah, I guess that. Uh um, so the bright yellow is low, right? Yes, yeah. So that's why Bernie had not such a hard time in the South, because uh, they're solidly one party or the other. Sol solidly oh, Democratic. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Um, so something else that, um, you know, we, we might hear from a cartographer is, why not just use class breaks? Mm. And what would you say to that, Jeremy? <laughs> Well, uh, class break is definitely an option. It's a really good option if you know really um, concrete breaks that make sense based on your data. Um, I think as a generic way to apply it, I think it's less it's, it's less interesting because it does break your data up, and people read into the breaks more than they should. Like in this map here, what's the difference between um, you know, a dark blue gets a 71, but a, a slightly less blue, 70.999. What's the difference between those two? So, <clears throat> um, classified maps are really made for printed cartography. You know, you needed to do what we were just doing there. I look at the color on the map, I look at the color on the legend, I can really only tell about six or seven colors apart, uh, and so I can figure out what's the general range of that data. But moving into the digital world, you don't need uh, to actually be able to visually match up the color with the legend. You can uh, just you know touch a feature and it'll tell you what its value is. Right. And uh, so that's why uh, we, especially from um, like if you were to talk about ArcGIS Online and its map viewer, we definitely would lead towards the unclassified approach because. Um, user doesn't have to think about this fairly complex problem uh, because it is a hard problem to classify because there, first you need to decide that you want to classify then you need to decide <coughs> excuse me which classification method you want to use there's natural breaks there's quantiles uh, there's uh, equal interval so which one of those to do and uh, you would have probably had to take a course in cartography to even know what those mean and then once you make that choice, uh, you need to decide how many classes do you want and how do you want to statistically break up the data within each class. So those are hard questions to, to answer. So that's why we tend to really push the unclassified uh, as a way to um, get a quick visualization that's relatively close uh, without you having to have that other knowledge. And then the maps just look better. There's more definition that gives the, as Jim Harris would say, it lets your data breathe, doesn't force it into this classed system. Yeah, you would otherwise have to bump these up a lot, and then yes. your legend is unreadable. Yeah. yeah. When I was, uh, uh, when I used to do that in ArcView 3, I would, 
you could do 30 breaks. That was the maximum. So if I really wanted to understand a data set, I would push it up to 30 breaks and then apply one of their color ramps, and then I could see <laughs> uh, color. Yeah. See where the where the data was interesting. Yeah, it's it, it's really hard to explain for sure, and and even defend if you're just kind of choosing them willy nilly. You know, mm. there are uh, definitely cases where you classification totally makes sense. You want to really you you have some key breaks, key indicators that make a lot of sense, and um, then you know, go for it. You know, like uh, twice the po you know the poverty level. Um, Maybe a one times the poverty level and one times below, and then out, outliers. You could make that call. Yeah. And I mean, you, Jeremy, just asked me an interesting question that kind of put me on my heels a little, a uh, little bit. And that <laughs> was, you know, how did you choose those values? And um, that's a good question. It's uh, how do we choose any of these values? And sometimes it, it's arbitrary. And and like I said, it's you can't really defend that. You know, mm -hmm. it's like it doesn't make sense. So, um, kind of as part of that, um, and also coupled with the fact that. A lot of us don't work with color very well. We don't choose the right colors, and they connote different things. Um, we kind of started this project called Smart Mapping. And what that's all about is, is we query your data for statistics, and then we use unclassed color ramps to try to drive meaning or to discover those stories that uh, Jeremy uh, mentioned earlier. So in this case here, we're looking at a map of, of income, median household income. And the uh, story that we're looking for is, you know, where do the higher income people live versus people with low incomes? And we don't know what the breaks are, we don't know what the average is, but Smart Mapping can actually give that to us. When we give it the layer, the field, it'll say, hey, the median, the median income is $85,000 a year. And, uh, if, and then it will also give the standard deviation breaks above and below it, and then we'll create a nice uh, unclassified uh, visualization that will show us where it is. It can be significantly below the uh, the average or above, um, and it it's it's easy to explain. It's a lot easier than explaining class breaks. That, mm -hmm. that can be very difficult to explain. And what's nice about it is we got some pretty uh, slick, uh, easy to work with APIs when it comes to smart mapping. We have a number of creator methods in our modules. Once you import the module, you will probably call a create continuous renderer or a create renderer method. And you always have to give it three things, at, at least. And that's a layer, the view that you're working with, um, either a field or an arcade expression. And then it will be able to do everything else for you. Choose the colors based on the base map, which is referenced in the view. Um, it'll even give you si a scale appropriate outlines or, or icon sizes based on your view and the density of the data. Um, when you're working with color, you can also provide a theme, and it will choose the right theme for you. And um, yeah, It's really all about giving you the best default. And because, like Christian said, it is hard. And um, the, some of the really nice features of 4x, now that we have a vector, lots of vector tile maps, which can be any color, by passing in the view, the API is smart enough to tell from the base map, is it a light base map, is it a dark base map, because that will really change the, the color ramp that, we, that you would want to use. Absolutely. Um, so to give you a quick glimpse of what's going on, um, we, you call that crater method with a number of inputs. Um, the base map part is not really relevant anymore, but it could be your attributes, your layer, your view, and then some, a lot of cases will uh, generate an arcade expression for our custom styles, such as relationship, age, we'll show you in a second. Um, we'll get statistics for that for that data, with that expression, and then we'll pick the color scheme based on your base map. And really, you could use any base map. It's not just Esri base maps. Your whatever background you have will get the average color and choose a light or dark schemes based on that. And then we'll construct the render for you that you would then apply back on your input layer. Um, so here are a number of the out of the box themes or sorry uh, styles that we provide in Smart Mapping. We have age. Basically, um, you provide a date field or two date fields. Say, I want to know, um, you know, how old or how this feature is, or maybe when was the, how long has it been since the previous inspection date? And if it's above or below a meaningful value, you can create a nice visualization for your organization. Um, there's also predominance. You already saw an example of this. This is an example of where are, um, what is the pr predominant language spoken in the home? Um, on the census tract level. So you can see an interesting pattern of 
uh, English people, uh, English only language being spoken at home versus Spanish, and then you have the Asian and Pacific Islander languages, and then you see um, other Indo-European languages in this green area right there. And then relationship render. This one um, is our newest of the arcade renders. It's um, basically a concept of, of taking two numeric attributes and then breaking them up in class breaks, assigning them their own color ramp, and then we kind of overlay them to see if there's a relationship between the two. Um, so in this one, we're looking at the relationship between diabetes and, and obesity. So you can see a pattern of, of or a, where those two variables agree in Appalachia, also in the Deep South, and also the areas where you know, you're high in obesity, but low in diabetes, such as Minnesota, or the opposite, you know, high in diabetes, but low in obesity in Texas. Hmm. Um, something that's brand new virtually in the API in December of last year, which was 2019, is symbol sizes by scale for all geometry types. Um, when you have a point layer, such as this world cities layer, um, or a line layer, we can generate the visual variables, the size variables that will change the size of those icons by scale. And even for outlines on polygons, we can control that for you. And I'll show you a couple of examples in a second. Um, and then we also added a smart mapping slider widgets for building authoring experiences. So the, the creator methods that um, we just showed you, those, like as Jeremy said, give you the smartest defaults that we can come up with, but that may not be what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we provide tools out of the box that you can create authoring apps for your users so they um, can play around with the data a little bit more. Maybe the average is not the, the midpoint they're looking for, so they need to bump that or around a little bit. Um, they want to change the sizes, the colors, the break values, and you have um, 10 different sliders or That's eight. A, we can just add something to that. I mean, um, Christian and uh, the team have worked really hard to uh, make these uh, next generation sliders you know, work better for keyboard accessibility. Um, but yeah, they go hand in hand with the smart mapping. It's like the smart mapping gives you a good default, and then you use these. See, you can see how the default was generated based on the histogram of the data, and then you can use um, the sliders to then tweak it to make it uh, more uh, make more sense with what you're actually trying to show. And with that, let's get, let's just look at a few of these examples. Um, so this is the uh, application that um, you saw in that image before. It's median household income. And something that's pretty cool about the sliders is, is we make them highly customizable. So you see that I'm formatting the labels on these thumbs. But when you edit it, that formatting goes away. So I can you know, enter whatever value, let's say like 90,000. And I don't have to worry about adding dollar signs, commas, or whatever. That, that's mm. just taken care of on the label. But you could label your input that way and, and set up a parsing function as well to handle that for you. Um, I also customize the histogram. The histogram is a statistic function we provide um, it, that will give you the, each of the bin values and the count. But you also have access to the bar elements. So I'm actually styling each of these bars based on the color that the data falls in in the map. And it even updates when I change the slider. So you can see where the really low, so if I want to change this to the federal poverty line, I can actually see areas in, you know, inner Los Angeles where there's, you know, households that are predominantly below the poverty line. So it's a neat data exploration mm -hmm. uh, tool. Look at that. Uh, that's pretty striking. Uh, the highest bar, the 201,000 yep. bar. Uh, look how big that. Uh, uh, one is yeah. So you see that up. So it's like uh, and that's the median, yeah. Here. So like uh, it does uh, illustrate the income gap. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here are the sliders in action. You have um, not just smart mapping sliders, but sliders for filtering your data. This is the histogram range slider. You have a time slider, a basic slider widget. These are all have intuitive APIs. For, um, for working with your data, exploring it, changing the visuals. And as Jeremy said, they're keyboard accessible. So I'm actually using my keys uh, right now to uh, move this thumb 
or tabbing between them. And this is a, I just want to point out what, that we are active in Arc, the ArcGIS blogging site. So um, not only myself, but um, people on our Living Atlas team, such as Lisa Berry, Jim Harries, uh, Jennifer Bell, they're all excellent blog writers. They blog about these styles and how you can work with them, particularly in the ArcGIS Online map viewer. And so Lisa wrote an excellent blog here on explaining what the relationship map is and the rationale behind it and how it works. So I encourage you to, to be active in, in reading these blogs. And here's an example of the relationship map. The API allows you to change the orientation, the labels of, of the legend, so you can create you know, dynamic interactive experiences like this where you're, you can be descriptive or you can show the raw numbers if you so choose. So here's a dot density example. Um, this is actually not uh, necessarily a smart mapping app, but this is showing a population by race in the United States. And the reason I was zoomed out so far is because you can see some interesting patterns just on this level. At this level, one dot is, uh, let's see, five, more than 5,000 people. Um, so I'm not getting that tile up in Washington. There we go. And, or it's 3,200 people, sorry. Um, but I also wanted to point out how fast these visual updates work. So I can change the dot value here. I'm gonna drop it down to one. So now we can see mm -hmm. where in uh, the Midwest, you know, predominantly white, but then you see um, South Florida and of course the Southern border and in the Central Valley of California, predominantly Hispanic. But then you see these purple uh, Native American reservations. Mm -hmm. And this um, area here that follows that democratic pattern um, is African American mm -hmm. patterns. And so very uh, interesting data to play with. Uh, and the uh, dot values actually change by scale. So now I'm looking at one dot is 50 people. And as I zoom in, you see that change. And you can make it interactive, update the render very quickly. I'm not filtering data here. This is actually updating those color values. So when you move your mouse over that, you're changing the renderer to have uh, the, everything that's not being hovered on be uh, the same kind of dimmed yes. dot yeah. Uh, color. Yeah, and that's because um, each feature can be very colorful, have any mm -hmm. number of dots. And I just really want to highlight the population of that color, yeah, not the cool. feature itself. Nice. And so this is uh, an example of the size by scale. Um, again, and this is a uh, look at the world cities. If I disable this, um, you know, I have dot sizes that are small, works well at this scale, but once I zoom in, let's go into say the UK, these dots are, Jeremy's having to lean forward, he can't see them. I can't see Whoa, them either. I can't see them, yeah. You can't see it at all. So what works well at a global scale doesn't work well when you're zoomed in. Mm -hmm. So the smart mapping method allows us to enable that, so it'll suggest this size at this scale. And as we zoom in, those size icons grow in size, so you can make nice. them visible. And what that's actually doing is generating this, this size visual variable. It's pointing to the view scale, for the arcade expression and mapping specific scale values to icon sizes. That view scale, that's, uh, that's part of that um, visualization um, arcade profile. So yeah, on every, um, that's one of the global variables you have access to. Correct, yep. And here's another example that will make pretty much any uh, cartographer cringe is really thick outlines. Mm -hmm. um, but you want thick outlines when you zoom in, though. Yeah, it, it doesn't work here, but I'm zoomed in here. Oh, that looks nice. Oops, it, it looks really nice, yeah. yeah. But again, you, it's unusable at this scale. I can't see what any pattern in Houston looks like. So if I enable that auto size, you can still see them, which is important. And even when you zoom out, they actually disappear because it's no longer useful to have them. But then you zoom in and they come back. Mm -hmm. And they're thicker, a little lighter, but that's so they look more aesthetically pleasing. There. Mm -hmm. The way you'd do that in the past is you might have a um, two different layers, 
and maybe three different layers at different scales, and they all had a d different renderer. Um, this allows you to sort of push all of that into one layer, one renderer. Yep. And this looks almost identical to that other size variable. The one difference is we add a target parameter to the outline so that the renderer knows that when we're changing the size, it's, it's only pertaining to the outline of that symbol. So let's go back to our slide deck. Um, so then you might ask, well, shouldn't I always use smart mapping then if it gives me good, pretty good defaults? And the answer is, well, well no. Like we, <laughs> there are certain cases when you want to use it, such as you know, building an authoring application for styling your layers, like the Arctis Online Map Viewer, exploring your data, like that uh, income app, or um, you know, maybe you want to represent unknown data that updates frequently. We have a few uh, users and customers who have live data that gets updated, so they use these methods to, to you know, vi change the visualization of their data when it updates. And, um, and then we also have statistical queries that are interesting for rendering charts and things like that. But you definitely shouldn't do it just because it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, you may already know your data well. I mean, earthquake data is an example where we already know that the largest earthquakes probably aren't going to be above a 7 on the Richter scale. Um, so you already know your data points. Um, and you might already have your colors determined by organization. Um, yeah, the, um, I think probably the main point of why you don't want to use it is the performance uh, that you get. Because you take a performance hit when using those. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And you don't want your app to be slow to have to figure out that data. So it's uh, you can author it yourself up front. Uh, or if you can use those tools to help you author it, but then actually take the, take the uh, renderer um, uh, configuration and just use it as is in your app. Or from uh, loading a layer item or a web map. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's what I think this point down here is. If you can just author it online, do it there. Yep. You know, it's the best way to do it. Um, but you know, let's say you, don't, you can't do it in online for whatever reason. You've got to do it in code. We actually give you a lot of helpful information in our guide pages. So if I flip back over to my browser, we actually added this new um, guide page about six months ago in September of 2019, this Esri Color Ramps Guide. We actually provide all of the several hundred color ramps out of the box to you directly where you could see what you want. Oh, this, this ramp looks cool. And then you can copy those hex values and just paste it directly into your app. Mm -hmm. Or you can um, you know, get the RGBAs or go directly to the documentation and see you know, which categories this belongs to. Uh, we also provide the, this helpful tool that allows you to filter, like if you want blue ramps and you want something that's diverging, so an above and below type scheme, and you have a light base map, you can get a nice set of, of color ramps available to you. Cool. Also, we have this um, visualization best practices I highly encourage you to read, um, which will go over that. Um, <laughs> And uh, another note is uh, clustering, um, which uh, this allows you to reduce your data, uh, point data only, into meaningful clusters. And uh, we don't necessarily have time to show all the different configurations, but I do want to point out that we have excellent documentation that describes each of these in this feature reduction cluster. So you can see kind of your basic clustering, what happens when you have visual variables? How does it summarize your data? And how does it look when you have a unique value render? So it will take, in this case, the predominant unique value and render your, your cluster that way. Mm -hmm. So it's a handy way of, of, of looking at your data. Um, and this is a, just an example of global power plants at this scale. Pretty, uh, pretty, hard, dense, yeah. pretty hard to read. It's bouncing around a lot. Okay. Enable clustering calculates client side, and I can now see that um, you know the predominant clusters in in Europe over here shows uh, more wind power plants. Um, in the United States, you see kind of a different pattern, but I just I also added this filter here, so I can change um, I can filter out the the power plants that don't produce as much power, and you see different patterns. And it's also to show you how fast that we update these clusters. Yep. 
and you want to talk about this, Jeremy? The oh, okay, yeah, we've been um, uh, since last Dev Summit. We spent a lot of time trying to improve the performance of when you change uh, your renderer. So if we look at these two examples here, uh, they're both pulling the same data set. One, um, and they're basically changing a renderer. They're actually changing two visual variables, a color and a size visual variable, which actually <clears throat> include arcade expressions from year to year. And um, every uh, year change is a new renderer that gets applied. So bef at last Dev Summit, you get something on the left there where it's really not usable. Uh, this Dev Summit, you get what's on the right. So we spent a lot of engineering work to, uh, once the graphics or the geometries are um, um, put onto the GPU, we want to leave them there. And we just want to update uh, the attribute data in memory and then uh, refresh uh, the data with those attributes. So it allows us to do these fast visual animations. Also like the, <coughs> uh, the demo that Christian did at the Dev Summit Plenary, which we definitely encourage you to watch, which takes this to the extreme. Yep. Um, so yeah, then um, if you want to go full custom with your icons, you have we have out of the box web styles, and you can create your own uh, sim symbols as well. Um, do we have time to go yeah, through? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, let's um, let's see here. Here we go. Okay, so in this, not sure what happened on the base map there. There we go. So we're looking at a style um, that was, uh, I don't remember his first name, but. Uh, uh, Saul Worman. Uh, Saul Worman, yeah. yeah um, uh, the guy who worked on uh, TED Talks created this style back in the 60s. Uh, basically, it consists of a, a regularly spaced grid of uh, circles or shapes um, that butt up against each other. And then there's a smaller version of that shape on the inside. And uh, you uh, size that inside of that shape based on how, uh, let's say, what's the, is it close to 100%? Uh, is, it, is it large or uh, it gets the full shape? If it's small, it gets a little tiny shape. And so we wanted to replicate this uh, in the JavaScript API. And uh, this is a sample of the SDK. And basically, we have a, 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 um, a sim marker symbol. And uh, that has two symbol layers, both the, the outer circle and the inner circle. The outer circle is fixed. Uh, well, it varies based on scale. Uh, but the inner circle is uh, driven based on the uh, actual data value. So I see the uh, expression there, force ratio. And this is the outer. That's the, one by, that's the outer one that's uh, only uh, changing its size based on scale. And the inner one is changing based on the percent forest. And um, we also then are coloring it by the population. Uh, so we're using a, a multi-layer vector marker symbol that are both have custom uh, um, expressions, primitive override expressions applied to them. And then we're also using a visual variable on top of that to color the inner circle based on it. So Let's yeah, you really growing size there. Yeah, definitely. You really get some. Uh, pretty uh, awesome data visualizations that uh, using the combination of all these techniques. Yep. And um, did you have anything else to share, Jeremy, before we wrap up? Um, no, I think that, that was it. Uh, yeah, we want to hear from you, um, uh, either in uh, GeoNet. Um, also, we're both on Twitter. My, yep. hand, my handle is uh, mapdex, M-A-P-D-E-X. Mine's uh, Kekenes, K-E-K-E-N-E-S. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you got questions on a visualization, you, know, you can hit us up at uh, either of those places. And, uh, yep, and I'm also posting these slides and also all the demos you saw here in my GitHub repo. It's just Ekenes slash conferences and then DS2020, and you'll find it in the 2D Viz folder. Um, so I encourage you to download the resources, try out these apps yourself. And by all means, hit us up on Twitter um, or on GeoNet, and we're more than happy to uh, field your questions. Yep. And uh, looking forward to seeing everybody in person next year. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming or watching. <laughs> <laughs>